Welcome to another weekly market insight where we take a deep dive to give you actual insight so that you can make informed decisions. With me today is Chris. So John is not here today. We're thankful because we're covering technology. Uh, that is the, the winner of last week's poll was automation. Uh, so Chris, you've been here before. You, you've sat in it now with me. How would how'd that go? Yeah. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a per perfect time to get, get John out of here, so I'm glad to be here. <laughs> it is. Now, we talked about technology, really, whenever you met with John. Uh, it was more on the deflationary aspect, but we're going to get into some automation today. Great. So, great. So let's, uh, let's talk about future of education. What, what are your thoughts about future education? Well, I just think that um, you're going to start seeing costs come down, mm -hmm. and that spending $40,000 a year for a degree may not may not be the way to go. Yeah, one example would be the MIT, right? They, they have their open source uh, where you can go out there and look at any of the lectures online uh, and you can actually earn a degree. It's not an MIT degree, but you will get that diploma to go through these. And that's been out there for a while, so it's not a new innovation. But we're also starting to see other innovation. Uh, so with Google Career Certificates, it's a way that Google is also entering this space where they are able to give you life skills, really employment skills that are beneficial without having to go through that big four-year uh, thing. So the MIT Open Course is still structured around the idea of an institution and the, the liberal arts type of format where you have so many hours, but Google certificates are going to be for preparing for jobs. So think of that as more like a trade certificate. Uh, but they may have a lot more meaning, especially whenever you look at the cost, $250,000, $300,000 for some of these elite institutions. Uh, and if you're not in an, a job field that really can pay that back, it may be beneficial if you're doing the 529 accounts for your children to just give them the money and maybe get them skills because $250,000, uh, let's say at, at 19 or 20, and you leave that alone, that's going to compound for quite some time. Do you really need to do much right. retirement planning if that's the case? Right. Uh, and then here locally, we have Launch Code. Uh, now, are you a little familiar with Launch Code? Not, not super familiar, but I, I get the idea of how there's going to be an exchange for training and then pay back once you actually get a job. Right. So uh, the founder of Square, uh, or one of the founders of Square, uh, was they moved from St. Louis to San Francisco because at the time there wasn't a lot of human capital uh, that was capable or trained to do the coding. So they needed to leave a very low cost wage environment to go to probably the highest wage environment in the country at that time, in the world really, uh, whenever you think about just how much Silicon Valley uh, impacts. But they realized that two thirds of the people actually could be trained to code. So they created this nonprofit where if you go and engage with them, I don't know their business model well, but I'm familiar enough with it uh, that if you um, go through their program, they get a certain percentage. So the, the cost structure and the way that education is being paid for uh, is changing. Uh, another thing is that is changing is no longer needing to be actually at, in an institution, right? So we, we've all over the last year experienced the work from home, or many of us at least. Uh, I know everyone in our front, firm has experienced the, uh, the work from home. Uh, and some of us with young kids are also doing the education from home. Uh, and this really opens the ability to do that education uh, from home because it's becoming more and more about being on a tablet or a screen than it is being physically present uh, somewhere. Uh, and, and this is going to have an impact uh, with this opportunity. I think we're going to have more diversity with types of education, education that can be better geared towards the individual child's uh, needs, uh, as well as maybe helping push back around uh, some of the things that we've done over the last, really, 100 years where you had corporate gypsies, where you had <laughs> parents that basically have to move uh, and go where the job opportunities are. Though that no longer may be necessary with the work from home uh, because you could work from really anywhere. And it's the work from anywhere that we see is some of the innovation uh, that is coming out of this. And if you can educate from anywhere, it's no longer bound by the home. Uh, we're actually already seeing an increase in recreational vehicles. Now, this isn't automation or any new innovation, uh, and there's still some, uh, some problems with that. Uh, what's, what would be one of the problems you could think of? Internet. Internet, <laughs> right. If everything is based off the internet. Well, uh, a, a, a company that's probably 
whenever you think of innovation, I, do, you, do you associate Tesla with innovation? A little bit, yes. A little bit. Well, they have uh, one of the products, it's not just cars, uh, it's not just batteries, it's not just spaceships. The reason they're doing the spaceships is because they're launching satellites. Uh, and they have a program called Starlink. Now, we got this infrastructure bill coming, right? and the infrastructure, one of the things that they're trying to do is get high-speed, broadband internet uh, to everyone, even if you're in the rural areas. Uh, and they're, they're, that, that's actually uh, part of this five, fifth generation or 5G right. component. Well, this is actually a sixth generation, so you skip the whole need of actually needing to do the infrastructure, at least terrestrial infrastructure, because it's all in space. Uh, so this would allow you to have high-speed internet anywhere, and it's available now. Uh, the, the places that I've seen uh, or the, the reviewers that have uh, done the beta test are claiming to get at least 100 megabytes, which is very, very high speed. Uh, yeah, it's not the, the full gigabyte or whatever that you can get whenever you're doing fiber, but this is just at the very beginning. Um, so a little bit more specialized workforce that can work from anywhere yes. at a little bit lower cost of training. Right, and, and you have that internet connection. Uh, but then the infrastructure here, the terrestrial, that 5G is also important. And uh, we've mentioned b before on these calls that the, uh, the fourth G, we, we talk about these, G is generation, uh, really allowed us to do Uber. It allowed us to do Lyft and a lot of the things because it was important to be able to, to take the, the GPS location, uh, the mapping, uh, and uh, the ability to connect with another person uh, so that you could really have that taxi cab experience on your phone. Uh, well, with 5G, that's going to expand capabilities, maybe augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, certainly a component uh, that we've had to deal with as we do a lot more work from home is how do you keep people connected. Uh, so there's a lot of things uh, that are coming with 5G, uh, but it's also crucial for, let's say, automate uh, the, the AI driving, right? It's the, the time and speed and the data that you're dealing with, it's important for these items that are now moving in space uh, to know where they are in space uh, and where other things. So we got the internet of things that are coming out. So it's all really and highly dependent on the ability for everything to be connected anywhere at very, very fast speeds. Otherwise, you can't do, let's say, uh, the, the self-driving RV where all you do right. while you're, you can work and you can travel to the next destination and your kids can do education and something else can, can do the driving. Uh, and actually, as they're getting into the artificial intelligence, they're realizing how important it is to have a body. And uh, that body allows you to have the relationship with things around you. Uh, the, it's like the, the I, and then there's some type of verb and something, so I am whatever. Uh, it, it's part of that, that structure that seems to be very important for actual intelligence. Uh, now, I don't know if, if the RVs are gonna make, uh, do you think we'll get flying RVs? Uh, uh, the, I, I know we saw Kathy Wood give a presentation the other day saying that they'll get the autonomous, their expectations were within five years for the autonomous driving. I think uh, the, the flying one's probably a little bit more than five years away. Well, New Hampshire is trying. Uh, they, they have written their laws, so that's usually where the flying cars are. So uh, whether we get Jetson or not uh, on the cars, I think they actually call it the Jetson Bell. I think we mentioned it before on here. Uh, but when we start to think about this, it's like, okay, that's great. One, this is about automation, and other than the ability for these uh, vehicles to drive, Aaron, let's stay focused on yeah. automation. <laughs> and these are all pie in the sky, uh, maybe five, 10 years, who knows how long. We've been talking about flying cars since the 1960s. We're still talking about flying cars. The place that we're probably gonna see this first is, would you say logistics, the point A to point right. B, that, that long haul uh, uh, travel? And we have this video, and it's from Toyota, uh, and I really just wanted to go through here because I think it starts to incorporate a lot of what we're talking about here. Uh, so they say, imagine a team. Well, a team of what? Team of robots. Uh, so you have these little uh, items that are kind of like the, uh, the movement back and forth, but you also have to be able to pick the items up to get them on these, kind of, let's call them sleds. Uh, and they have different versions of pallets depending on how high or low they are. Uh, that's probably insignificant. It's just the idea that all of these can work as one and they swarm. Uh, they, they're able to work in a unified manner. Now, that unification uh, or the task, which is going to be loading and offloading uh, vehicles that are bringing products in there, needs to be 
continuous and it that means high speed internet because they need to know where they are what schedule they are and it seems like it's for our, our experience a that 100 megabytes versus a one gig is a big deal uh, for the the robots and trying to really coordinate to allow them to get to the internet of things uh, so this is uh, obviously toyota's uh, really big into the automation they see this as a growing field uh, but it would allow a warehouse to really use a lot less people uh, and maybe not even need people to do the driving and have that point A to point B and do the warehousing all in one. So it's, it's like the Amazon model, but once the costs come down, some more firms that didn't want to do that big spend up front to get there early right. can, can start to adopt this. But one thing that the Amazon model has that we're not really addressing here is what? The last, the last mile the of delivery. The last mile. The last mile of delivery. Uh, and. Uh, Ford and Amazon, many people are working on this, but Ford had a great video on what they see where they have their own uh, AI drive, self-driving vehicles. Uh, the thing is, is, if you don't have a driver, there's still the last 50 feet. It's not just the, the last mile, right? So now we get to meet Digit. Uh, and Digit is the solution because it's easier, not easy, but easier to have vehicles automatically drive on paved uh, unobstacled, if that's a word, uh, uh, road. Uh, what do you do whenever you have stairs? You have kids' toys that are, this must be my house with the yeah. kids' toys <laughs> laying all over the place. Well, Digit is more looking like us. Um, it always makes me laugh when you see the, uh, the Amazon guys because they always have to pull out their phone, document the delivery. I'm sure Digit just takes a quick screen grab once he, once he sets that package down. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, the, the, the quick, and you could, you could have multiple, right? So the Amazon van shows up and maybe several digits are just running out and, and dropping things. Uh, but we're not just using Amazon for delivering our packages. Uh, there's also a new phenomenon with the, uh, the work from home, work from anywhere, and the restrictions that were placed on us that not that the grocery store was any fun ever, <laughs> uh, but it's certainly less fun, right? So what about groceries? Because you have the app shipped, uh, something that uh, Target has put in a lot of money uh, to develop, and then you have the, uh, uh, the Instacart, uh, where you're able to order your groceries. Well, Kroger is already on this, and they're, they're trying to, uh, to automate this and make it easier, uh, especially since less people are worried about going into the building. Uh, the whole idea is that the grocery store would actually become a warehouse, and they're automating that. Uh, there's, and this is not pie in the sky here. They actually have one being built in Butler County, Ohio, uh, and they have several more uh, in, uh, in the works. Now they're using these uh, these robots and, the, and warehouse management. Can you guess how long it would take a person to collect 50 items versus these items? A person uh, probably take uh, about two or three times as long. Uh, more than that. Uh, so it takes wow. about five minutes for these, and it would take a, a person about 40 minutes. So wow. uh, it, it's reduced, and it's just a, this is just getting started. They're I'm sure rethinking the uh, the the grocery store in the mindset of a warehouse versus right. a layout that's going to be attractive to customers but there's probably a lot more efficiencies to be gained whenever you really start to move remove the customer uh, and then you throw this with the ford uh, and, and digit the ability to, to get your groceries uh, selected ordered and delivered think about it you just put it on the phone five minutes later there it may already be in the basket right. uh, being put onto the uh, the truck by digit uh, showing up into your neighborhood where they probably have several orders and dropping them off so no longer do we necessarily need to have to be in a grocery store and it's you know always been a tough spot for grocery stores where margins are really thin so yes they're, they're always looking at a way they can cut costs and weren't really ready to put out that capital expenditure for something like this right. yet but it, it is becoming, right. robotics is becoming cheaper. Yes. Uh, and uh, you probably don't need as much floor space if you don't need the very wide aisles uh, that you do uh, in the current grocery store, uh, which would probably speed up this process uh, further, but they're building their own uh, warehouse. Now, grocery shopping isn't the only uh, chore, at least not the only chore that I dislike. Uh, I think the one that I dislike the most is folding our clothes. Now, I, I think this behemoth of a machine <laughs> is probably not arriving in my house in any near time and, until it's smaller. And there is one thing that I dislike uh, more than folding clothes, and that's putting them away. 
So I want my own digit so the digit can come in here and, and load this machine and put the, uh, the clothes away. Uh, but imagine some of the things that we're going to see freeing up our time, allowing our time to be more leisure focused at home because a lot of the chores we can automate. It. Maybe the grocery store uh, could even be further limited uh, because you could have your own garden if you have the space where robots are doing the own garden so you always have it fresh. There's a lot of things that can come out of this. Uh, but what about the actual buildings, especially since we're going to need different buildings and we're going to, we're going to build them? Some of the high-skilled labor and the cost is also being ro uh, taken to, to robotics. So here you have an example of uh, uh, some masonry work. Uh, I'm sure the people that know construction are going to send me a thing saying, no, that's not exactly what that is. Um, but there's going to take less skill to know how to operate this machine versus the, the time that it takes. And I think one of the areas that it takes the most skill, in my own ignorance, but from uh, friends that have gone into the construction area, it seems like the masons are always the highest skill. It takes the longest time to really master that trade. Uh, and here we have a robot that's, that's doing that. Uh, now, can you foresee any problems uh, if we have robots building buildings and we have a high demand for them and the labor cost of building buildings has, has been lowered? the amount of commodities and resources, uh, right? right. Uh, so uh, what do you do? You may see a drop in the, the cost of building buildings and a need for new buildings uh, to, uh, to really be more efficient for these robot use, uh, but that's going to put a demand on commodities, right? Because now it's cheaper to buy, uh, to build them, you could build more of them, which means you need more right. material. And that's what we're seeing with lumber, where the prices have doubled over right. the last couple of years. Uh, I think over the last year it's uh, what, is 100 and something percent. Uh, it's a thousand dollars per feet. So there's automation and, and robots that are being used here. Uh, and this is an example which actually is can be more environmentally friendly because the way that they they do this lumbering it, it is not as hard on the terrain. Granted they're still taking the trees uh, but you figure they're growing trees now and straight lines and you could just run up and down with this machine. But this machine is just clearing the branches, cutting them into, imagine if they were milling them at the same time. That doesn't, in my mind, doesn't seem like it's that big of a leap to also just be milling the lumber uh, straight from this machine. So we should be able to do automation in the procurement of commodities uh, as well. So that should help offset it. Now, if we have all of these machines working, what's something that we would definitely need more of? energy. Uh, now, uh, I, I think people that have been listening uh, to these calls uh, are aware that uh, I'm not so much uh, against fossil fuels. I think they have their place. I, I think that we're kind of getting a little bit too far ahead of ourselves uh, with, with this, but solar power especially looks very promising long term, uh, where the price of uh, gathering uh, solar energy uh, continues to drop and we can see the it's plummeting really. Uh, this is a logarithmic scale uh, so it's just to show that trend line and that trend line looks very similar to the Moore's trend line where it's like every 18 months right. we, we could see a doubling of the amount of transistors that we could get on our chip uh, and now we're seeing that similar trend line where the cost of solar power uh, is becoming very very low. Now, What are some of the negatives that keep from full adoption? Uh, well, one of the, I think one of the big negatives, and we had mentioned that with the, the increased harvesting of trees and lumber and commodities, is the impact on environment. And a lot of people think, well, solar panels have no impact on the environment. They just collect uh, sun. The energy production is certainly true, but the, uh, the actual panels uh, use a lot of materials, much of which is not very good for the environment if it's just discarded in uh, the, the dumps, and they're difficult to mine. Uh, and silver, the precious metals, one of the reasons it's probably moved up while gold uh, has uh, remained steady is because this is looking so promising. Silver is a major uh, component, a precious metal that's used in there. So you have the ability to get, uh, to, what do you do with the solar panels as they wear away, especially if they're on everyone's house? That could be a problem for landfills. Uh, the, the other, and I think the bigger part uh, that we saw, let's say, in Texas, because uh, they have a, a large amount of their energy is provided by uh, wind, but also solar power. 
And that's really the, the issue that I think has got to be solved before this can really go mainstream. And that's the storing of energy, that battery life. Right? You have to be able to collect uh, the, the energy when the sun is shining. Because if you need to increase your capacity, you can't just turn a knob and the sun is going to uh, uh, shine a little bit brighter. Uh, you, you need that. So the ability to store energy whenever the sun is bright it's typically when you uh, uh, need some less energy because you don't need as much lights on when the sun is there. I know there's air conditioning. I'm oversimplifying for sure. Uh, but it doesn't always line up with the energy need and the energy provided by the sun that has to be deal dealt with. Now, solar panels have a lot of uh, precious metals. The batteries also have a lot of precious metals, specifically lithium. Uh, and lithium is a very rare element and it's very difficult and it actually emits a lot of carbon dioxide to mine it out of there. So that, this is one of those crucial areas that need to be solved for electric vehicles and, and other things to really go to the, uh, the mainstream where we can actually replace combustion engines in any meaningful way. Uh, and, and that is yet to be solved. They are working on trying to get rare earths uh, synthetically created, Tesla, and I think, uh, what, I know the ticker's QS, what's the name of that company? QuantumScape? I think that's QuantumScape, yes. Uh, where they, uh, they believe that they can create some of these rare earths uh, to be uh, synthetically. Um, and if you can create it synthetically, we can do diamonds now. Uh, there's an artificial uh, scarcity of diamonds uh, that, are, that is being controlled because there's a monopoly on diamonds. You wouldn't have that effect. There's not uh, an agreement basically in society. They want diamond rings to be rare because of the, the meaning they have. You wouldn't have that impact here. Uh, so that, that rare earths would be uh, synthetic. So. Uh, being able to create those synthetically, if you have an infinite amount of energy essentially that you could collect at low or even no cost, the energy would cease being really an economic good. It would start to become like air. Air is not an economic good. It's vital. It's important. We need it. Uh, we absolutely will sell it if you're going scuba diving, right? You need to get your tank filled. Uh, but the air itself is a general condition, uh, and that would allow you to do everything. We don't consider that an economic good. In that situation, energy starts to look like a general condition. So your RV that we talked about, uh, you can make it as big as you want because the footprint doesn't matter. It's not that hard to travel. It probably has its own solar panels, and with good batteries, maybe it's collecting more energy than it ever would be using while it's uh, moving. Uh, and maybe at some point we throw wings on these things and Spaceballs had it correct where the RV is now our, our thing. I think Elon Musk should be working on this. He should combine all the things that he's doing to be able to achieve the, the, the Spaceballs example of the RV in space. I'm sure he'll tweet about that <laughs> uh, But if you can create synthetic and you're manufacturing rare earths, what about 3D printing? This is one that you really like. Yeah, this was something John and I talked a couple of weeks ago. Just kind of, we, we talked specifically about shoes. Yes. And how if you could 3D print a shoe instead of having it made in some warehouse or across the world, maybe they're making those a couple dozen miles from your house. Right. So whenever 3D first came out, I think everyone was really excited about it. And some people even ordered it and they realized all that it can do is make knickknacks and unless they're a good painter they can't even really have that much color to it. Uh, so it was something that had a lot of hype at the beginning. But as you mentioned, they're now printing shoes. These are actual items that you would have bought uh, and, and need, and it solves a lot of logistics problems. Maybe Digit isn't as uh, needed, and they, the, uh, all the automated driving isn't as needed for the logistics. It solves some of that, uh, that problem, kind of getting things to be more free, almost to that general condition. You would still need resources, right? But it's not just consumer products. Uh, they're talking about synthetic and, and printing your lunch, I think I'm going to do without. Yeah. Uh, Bill Gates has been talking about uh, synthetic meat as well, uh, where it's protein-based. This one looks like they're actually putting in fats and even blood in there. I I'm going to hold off on this. Uh, but if you can print flesh and meat, what medical implications does that have? Because you could print organs. And then 
some of the things that you could solve uh, is uh, just you wouldn't need to do immunosuppression because you're transplanting somebody else's organ into yourself. One of the areas that innovation uh, is going, this is not so much automation, except that you would be printing it at some point, is we are able to uh, look at our own DNA. And if we could take that DNA, tell the machine, hey, this is what my organ should look like, then you don't have the rejection. You have a lot of easier to, uh, to transplant. Uh, and, and this would have medical implications and increased longevity for life. Uh, and at some point, uh, if this continues on, I feel like we'd be in that Star Trek environment where we just get to replicate. We walk up and we want whatever we want. We just say, replicator, I want my tea or I want my uh, whatever vintage scotch. And you just basically print or make something materialize within that structure. Uh, so that would be uh, a brave new world uh, for us to, to have that experience. Now, what do you think most people's concern uh, from all of that, what we just covered? What, what's the thing that's, that's well, looming? Yeah, uh, getting a little too far ahead with uh, the knowledge of, of the technology. Yes, uh, one that I don't have in here is uh, another place that uh, robotics are being used heavily. We can see it in the Syrian theater right now uh, is drones and other robots within the, uh, the war structure. But I think the ones that a lot of people are concerned about and we hear universal basic income in the, the recent policy uh, uh, discussions as government is trying to figure out how to provide for people because they have a view that this would increase uh, unemployment. Um, and there would certainly be less jobs for delivery, less jobs for construction. Uh, there will be new jobs. I think one of the reasons that this is going to be a problem is because of monetary policy and government policy, we're actually tilting the field in favor of capital uh, procurement, creating this technology maybe a little bit early before we need it uh, because we've kept interest rates so low. And at the same time, we've put in for motivations that are not wrong. They want to increase standard of living of individuals. So they want to increase the minimum wage. Uh, they want to provide benefits. Well, those all bring cost to labor. And there is this back and forth between labor and capital. And if we tilt the, 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 the field in favor of capital, it could be labor that's moving out. Ultimately, these don't have to be uh, at odds with each other. Uh, if you were allowing interest rates to increase because there's more demand, because there's more capital uh, in automation being invested, it would become more costly to add new capital. And as that capital really makes it cheaper to work and uh, you need lower skills, that brings down the cost of labor, which may sound bad at first, but considering everything is also going down at price probably at a faster pace, uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, hurt and then you would just higher people instead of capital. So the, the market forces can bring these two in balance and slowly make this progression. Uh, so I don't think that's the long-term problem. I think we are going to see some short-term problems because the, 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 uh, the policies that we have pursued have continued to favor capital over labor. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the, the long-term problem is really Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, we could have everything provided for us in this uh, situation. Shelter is cheaper from uh, robotics and automation. The ability to have your food is cheaper, especially if you like the idea of synthetically printing it. Uh, the, uh, all the shelter, all those basic needs are there. But then we have the safety needs. Well, you, you, you could actually have robots as your own security, right? We already do this. Uh, I actually will connect with my son throughout the day by going to our security system and use the cameras uh, to catch him doing things that he probably isn't uh, supposed to be doing. But uh, there's a lot of security from uh, this new technology. That employment component is there too. If you don't have to do a lot of wrestling with the world to try to provide these things, there's a meaning uh, component that may be lost. So I think we're going to have a meaning crisis. But love and belonging, we start to move up, giving that example of the work from anywhere uh, and educate from anywhere. I think you could see tighter family units uh, and smaller social groups that spend a lot more time together because we're no longer structuring our world around a location where our networks are. We can network from anywhere. So that could have that enhancement. And then obviously this moves into self-esteem and self-actualization as the hierarchy uh, is there. Now, just because you provide for material meaning, uh, material goods and shelter, doesn't necessarily mean that you can move up. It, it does take this, this struggle component, uh, which I think is, is the area that we'll deal with 
and struggle with most going forward is, is how do we find our meaning uh, in life? I think it's a rethinking of life, probably in a good way, uh, especially for those that really want to pursue that. Uh, but there will be uh, individuals that, that don't want to move up that pyramid because it's so easy on the, the, the bottom. So I think that's, that's the areas that will be the biggest struggle. So that is ending our automation part uh, and, and innovation, technology, and all the other things that we covered. So we have uh, the, the investment themes. So whenever you talked about technology, you talked about the deflationary components. And I think after watching this, we certainly can see those deflationary arguments uh, because the, the cost of labor and the cost of building things could absolutely come down and, and plummet. So inflation, uh, here that we're concerned about is just the amount of money that we've been created. The thing that is helping offset that is it's being used to create items that make us more efficient, and that's deflationary. We still think, at least in the, uh, the near term, uh, and the Fed and the news seems to be uh, uh, to, to back this up, and they're catching up to that story. They're saying it's transitory, but I don't think anyone's arguing that inflation isn't about to hit. Uh, most people are, are, are conceding that, it, at least in the near term, it's going to be there. Uh, so that continues to be our theme. I don't think we have the number on it, but uh, I think yesterday was the first day of the new monthly money supply from the Fed. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have the exact number, but it, it was. Uh, I think it was 13.9 percent for annualized growth. Uh, for annualized growth, yes. Uh, but some of the things that we may be missing out on that movement, uh, we're still trying to figure out how to derive. Uh, we favor equities over fixed income. Uh, as interest rates move up, we've seen a lot of volatility in the market. Um, but at some point, maybe we can get interest rates high enough that they become attractive again. Uh, so uh, that, that is actually one of the benefits of seeing interest rates move up. At some point, uh, it, it's nice to add those back in to the portfolio. Continue to favor U.S. domestic equity. Uh, and I think if we can get to that China bear case, I think we can make the reason why we think the U.S. is better positioned uh, than China, both of which have problems, but we'll continue to say you, the U.S. is the cleanest dirty shirt in the closet. Maybe they need Digit. We can go out there, we can have Digit clean our laundry and, and get, us, uh, get the shirt cleaned up. Uh, favoring technology, I think that this really shows why the growth story is still in technology over the next 10 years. Uh, for sure, even though we're getting that, to that rotation. Um, bearish on real estate and international, probably a little more bearish on international than real estate. Uh, we think real estate with all of these will be more focused on the experience. Uh, so maybe we get away from the idea that we need all these cubicles uh, that are never fun and kind of bland to uh, greater, more aesthetic appealing uh, environments because we're really focused on the experience than we are having to just cram a bunch of people in a small space because the space is so limited uh, to get the network effect. Uh, and then continue to see that re residential move from large cities towards sub suburbs. Um, probably not going to stop. Uh, you have seen some articles uh, in the New York Times and some other people trying to say, hey, we, New York is still here, but at the same time, many of the CEOs in New York is cautioning the, the, the state legislator not to raise taxes because it, it will expedite that, uh, that movement. Uh, so that's our themes. Uh, market movement, uh, or the S&P, uh, not back at, at uh, recent highs, but still close to that top. Still seeing that rotation. Uh, still see a lot of technical support uh, at a 10% correction, which would be painful. Uh, but it, uh, we're seeing more of a correction so far in, uh, this year in bonds than we are equities, even though the volatility is there, uh, which we can see in our, our uh, relative strength for the different asset classes. Uh, small cap, especially on the value side, mid cap, all the value and smaller uh, um, uh, cap, or the, the, the less the market share, uh, market valuation, I'll eventually get it out, uh, of the, the stocks, the better they've done year to date, but now they're starting to become yellow. So that means there's a little bit of a slowing here. Uh, the S&P 500 is in the middle. For a couple of weeks, it was near the, the bottom. Uh, but we continue to watch this rotation, continue to try to be really uh, more core focused uh, because we just don't know, is this just a, a rotation that, that tech got a little too, uh, uh, too, val too expensive uh, and there's a move to value or is this a change in trend? Uh, interest rates have also uh, played into that theme. Uh, 
Uh, still too early to say right. what that trend it is. Happen. It happens so quickly. It's something right. you want to make sure you don't chase it. Right. That's not going to be a trend. Right. But you also don't want to miss out on it. So we're kind of, I like to say we're hiding out in the benchmark, meaning that uh, we don't know which uh, theme is going to uh, win out. So we're just going to wait and kind of hedge our bets on that. Over. All right. Well, I think that is uh, uh, all that we're going to cover. Uh, so. I usually tell John, uh, to, uh, or he asked me maybe uh, on what to subscribe. John, we miss you on this part, uh, but we're thankful you weren't here for the technology talk. Uh, <laughs> if you want, uh, please, while you're watching this, click below and subscribe, hit that subscribe button uh, so that you never miss an update, whether it's a weekly market insight uh, where we take the deep dive to give you actual advice so you can make informed decisions to get the skinny out of three by three. And what else is coming? At some point in the second quarter, we're going to launch a, a less formal, more of a podcast style called a Casual Friday Analysis, CFA, where uh, at least two of our chartered uh, financial analysts will be on and talk about maybe some more niche topics in the market. Yeah, especially some of those ideas that are, are popping up and getting right. a lot of media attention. To be able to get what we think about it, whether it's right or wrong, you would at least know what, how uh, our views and some commentary to, to hopefully make you uh, a little more informed on what's going on. but. I think we're excited about it because we think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. So uh, thank you and we appreciate it. Please uh, tune in next week uh, where John and I uh, will be back. Uh, and uh, thank you. <laughs>